Good morning. Brethren, please take your seats and settle down. Praise the Lord for for His grace to us this morning, for appointing this time for us to gather together. As Christians, we, we know for sure that God has been merciful to us. He has been so merciful to us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That because of Christ, those who believe in Him are justified by faith and reconciled to God. And also have the hope of everlasting joy. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And having received God's saving grace and mercy through Christ, we are now called to constantly worship God. And through worship of God, according to Romans 12, 1, is a presenting of our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to God. Now this is the language of worship from the Old Testament. In coming to God, the worshiper brought a sheep or a bull or a pigeon and sacrificed it on the altar as an offering to God. There were different kinds of sacrifices, but at the heart of it was that sin demanded punishment and the slain animal represented God's willingness to accept a substitute so that the worshiper might live and have an ongoing relationship of forgiveness and joy and love with God. But all the Old Testament believers knew that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away their sins. They pointed beyond themselves to Christ, the Messiah, who was the final sacrifice for sin. Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And that was the final sacrifice for sin because it was perfect and sufficient for all who believe. Most clearly of all, Hebrews 10, 12 says, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So Jesus Christ brought to an end the Old Testament sacrifices for sin. He finished the great work of atonement. His death cannot be improved on. All we have to do now is trust him for that great and finished work. We do not, we should not, we cannot add to it. So when Paul says that our worship is to present our bodies as a sacrifice, he does not mean that we die and atone for our sins. The point is to stress here that your body counts, that you belong to God now. Your soul, your body, you belong to God or you do not belong to Him at all. Your body matters. Now, you might think, why would God be interested in my body, right? I mean, think of this body of mine, uh, maybe we think, you know, it's overweight or it's underweight for some. It's, it's not really that nice. The skin maybe is like this. Maybe I have many wrinkles, maybe. So if we are thinking that way, that's not what it means here. And even when we think that way, God demands a flawless sacrifice, right? So I don't measure up. And that kind of thinking totally misses the point. The sacrifice of our bodies to God is not a sacrifice for sin. That is done already in the sacrifice of Christ. That's, uh, that's what we already saw earlier. Which is why bodies like ours are acceptable. It's because of Jesus Christ that our sacrifices to God are acceptable. So again, that's not about that. Because our body in and of itself will never be accepted by God. We don't deserve. Our bodies won't be acceptable before God, whatever that we do. Because it is not by our perfection, we cannot be perfect anyway, it's through the perfection of Christ. But again, another point is that kind of thinking misses the, the really 
what the Bible is telling us. The offering of our bodies is not the offering of our bodily looks, but, but our bodily behavior. In the, in the Bible, the body is not significant because of the way it looks, but because of the way it acts. The body is given to us by God to make visible the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the meaning of worshiping God daily, constantly, is here God is saying God wants us, the Christians, He wants that visible, lift out bodily evidence that our lives are truly built on the grace and mercy of God through Christ. Just as the worshipers in the Old Testament denied themselves some earthly treasure when they sacrificed, right? A sheep, a goat, a bull, and then carried their sacrifices to the altar of blood and fire. So we too, Christians today, Christ is calling us to deny ourselves, to take up His cross, to follow Him wholeheartedly, to love Him more than other relationships on earth, to really deny some early treasures perhaps or ease or comfort and carry ourselves for Christ's sake even to the places and the relationships and the crisis in this world where God's mercy is needed. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. This is also talking about our daily walk and lifestyle. Present your bodies continuously as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It is your living that is the act of worship. So God says, let every act of your body in living be an act of worship. That is, let every act of your living body be a demonstration that God is truly your treasure. Let every act of your living body show that Christ is more precious to you than anything else. Let every act of your living body be truly a uh, death to all that dishonors Christ. Probably the best explanation of holy bodies comes from Romans 6.13 where Paul said almost the very same thing actually that he says here during using that very language of presenting our bodies to God. Only here he refers to our bodily members and not just our bodies. When he says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for right, unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and you and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So see, brethren, that's what God wants for us. Present a living holy body to God. Give our members, our sides, our tongues, our hands, our feet, and the, the wholeness of our being we give to God to do His righteousness not to sin, to do that which honor, that honors God. We do everything for the sake of Christ. Christ always first and foremost. And brethren, even think about that, about sacrificing to God. It is not actually something that is burdensome because if we remember, if we let our hearts always remember, who are we? We do not deserve, right? The mercy of God that is so rich, granted upon us, the pouring of His love to us through Christ. What a wonderful thought that, that should be always in our minds every, every day when we wake up in the morning. Not only when we come to church, but every day, remembering in it, Lord, oh, I'm just so thankful of Your great mercy to me. Thank You, Lord, that I'm this sinner, this wretched one who deserves hell and punishment but not anymore because of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Now you are my Father in heaven. Now every day, every day, Lord, my desire is to serve you, to glorify your name, to spread indeed the good news of salvation to others, to serve in the body of Christ, to just build up one another in love and good deeds for the sake of Christ. So let's all rise at this time as we remember the great mercies of God through Christ Let's be encouraged also to give Him praise, to really say through our singing this morning, yes, Lord, we want to present our bodies as living sacrifices unto You, holy and acceptable unto God.
This life is an altar Where I want to offer My soul And my mind And strength Cleanse by your mercy To live a life holy Of the one Who called my name
Just one breeze, just one dream, and my soul is Oh Christ, you deserve, you deserve our sacrifices, Lord. You deserve to be worshipped daily, constantly. We have hope because of you. We're forgiven of our all of our sins because of Christ. Oh, the Lord, teach us how to follow you wholeheartedly. Teach us how to deny ourselves, to take up the cross. Teach us to love you more than all kinds of love, even with our own loved ones here on earth. For you are our most precious We love only because you first loved us. The great love of Christ may continually be the meditations of our hearts daily so that we will be moved to live only for you, only for your sake, only for the honor of your name. the sin of the cross and not be changed by the love in your face how can I look at the nails in your hands and not be moved by the price that you pay how can my eyes See the road that you walk and turn my back and just go on my way. I see you now, oh my Lord and my God, and I am faced with the choice that I must make.
Philippians 1, 20-21 As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be all, at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Show indeed, Lord, we pray that we will show indeed the word of Christ by the way we use our bodies, by the way we live our lives, by the way we walk in constant worship, bowing down to no one else and nothing else but Christ, our King, our Redeemer. We commit to you our time of work, continuous worship even here in this place right now. Christ alone, only Christ, be magnified. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Good day to you all and blessings. As you all know, since we've been allowed to gather to worship on site, we have been allotting time for spiritual fellowship every Sunday. Thus, we've been exploring what the New Testament had written about koinonia or fellowship. And it is my hope that this short exercise would help us practice fellowship in the rich full or the way it, has, it was practiced in the first century church. We understand, of course, that God created men and women to be social creatures, to enjoy relationships with family and friends. This is the reason why we feel sorry for the loner, whether on the job, in school, or in church. Now, some people may not realize it, but God created us to enjoy life in the right way, of course. And this is the reason why the exercise of koinonia includes a social dimension. The problem, however, has been that Christians often never go beyond the social dimension of fellowship. Thus, I have been emphasizing the need to build one another spiritually, and to come into partnership with one another in prayer. But in the New Testament, we detect that the church that was formed on the day of Pentecost demonstrated a balanced approach to fellowship. On the other hand, the people devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to prayer, and to fellowship. But on the other hand, they also gave themselves to breaking bread. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This probably means that the observance of the Lord's Supper and the sharing together of social meals, that was what it was referring to when they said breaking bread. In other words, aside from the spiritual exercise, they also enjoyed conversing and fraternizing with each other over a meal. Acts 2 verses 46 to, 46, 46 to 47 gives us a picture of this. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, 
they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. We may also note that the Lord Jesus himself took time to engage in social interaction. The four Gospels record numerous occasions for his eating in someone's home and of his attendance at feasts and, and weddings. He even performed his first miracle at a wedding celebration in Cana. One of his most moving parables, that of the return of the prodigal son, reaches its climax with the father exclaiming joy and proclaiming, let us eat and celebrate. The Lord Jesus also said of himself that the Son of Man came eating and drinking and that because of this participation, because of this social interaction, he was called a glutton and a drunkard. While the charge was obviously untrue, it does indicate that his reputation as one who thoroughly enjoyed social occasions and social interaction. But of course, we dare not miss the truth that like every other activity in the Christian life, social interaction should have as its ultimate objective the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 tells us, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So we also need to have this as an objective and thus plan our social activities in such a way that they uphold still the New Testament concept of koinonia. In other words, in many of our social interactions, it is both appropriate and beneficial to turn our thoughts on spiritual values. Therefore, today, let us go around and engage in social interaction in order to build up one another. But this exercise means that no one here, not a single soul here, whether he or she be a guest or a first-timer or a regular member, no one should be left as a loner with no one to converse with. So, higher rockers, I want you to reach out and be welcoming towards our guests and first-timers. And I will quiz you about their names later on. With your face mask and face shields on and maintaining social distance, please interact with the folks around you. Coffee and some biscuits are set up in the hallway. I know that you would love to have more time, and I'd love to give you that. But we need to go back to our seats and prepare once more to sing one more song in worship. So, please rise, brethren, sing this song together. Forever, Jesus, my firm foundation in shifting sands, my strength on hope through many fears and failures, the disappointments of the past, His constant love has held. Be fast. O 
Lord, oh Lord, all my days I will sing my praise to the King forever, Jesus. Though the songs will rage, He is strong to save. He's the King forever, Jesus. My shout of joy shall be forever, Jesus. Who brought the suffering? Who made the way? His life a gift, his death a precious ransom that wipes the sinner's guilt away and turns our night to glorious day. Forever, Jesus, when shadows lengthen before my eyes, my Lord and friend, companion to the valley, when dearest ones are left behind, His hand will lead me to. eternal God in whom we have found life because of Christ Jesus who paid the ultimate price on the cross of Calvary for in our stead and we thank you O God for Jesus said that your word is eternal heaven and earth will pass away but your word will be forever it is for this very reason, dear God, that we come today to worship you and to open your word. We ask, dear God, that as we ponder the truths of Scripture, your grace will be upon us. You will allow us, dear Lord, to look to you with eyes riveted that we might hear you speak to every one of us. 
We thank you, Father, for the blessed time that we have together. We give you all praise in Christ's name. You may all take your seats. Today, I have decided to take leave from pulpit duties in order to address some medical issues uh, which has long been delayed. Um, but not, not to worry, uh, I'm fine. I'm Iron Man. <laughs> no, my wife really hates that when, when I say that. Uh, no, I, I just have to... I just have to uh, uh, see my doctor. I did. Had, I had a teleconsult a few days ago. And there are some tests that I have to, to do. So uh, I've taken leave. And this is also in keeping with uh, uh, our agreement with the ESI that I will take leave from the pulpit every now and then. So to address my, to manage my uh, medical condition, my medical, my health. So... I've asked Brother Lito to share God's word this morning, so prepare your hearts to receive the word through Brother Lito. Good morning. Uh, it doesn't look uh, <laughs> natural. Uh, sitting, uh, standing here because of these uh, vinyl panels. But nevertheless, I thank the Lord for this opportunity to bring before you God's Word this morning. But before we do, I'd like you to join me in a word of prayer. Father, we once again ask for your blessing upon your Word. We ask that you might indeed magnify your name before us. Help us to see you. Help us to hear you. And not a man, Father God. Lord, we commit this time now into your hands. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. One time, a young man came to the four-time and oldest prime minister of England, William Ewart Gladstone. And this young man said, Mr. Gladstone, I would appreciate your giving me a few minutes in which I may lay before you my plans for the future. I would like to study law. Yes, said the great statesman. What then? Then, sir, I would like to gain entrance to the bar of England. Yes, young man, what then? Then, sir, I hope to have a place in Parliament in the House of Lords. Yes, young men, what then? Press Gladstone. Then I hope to do great things for Britain. Yes, young men, what then? Then, sir, I hope to retire and take life easy. Yes, young men, and what then? He tenaciously asked. Well, then... Mr. Gladstone, I suppose I will die. Yes, young man, what then? The young man hesitated and said, I never thought any further than that, sir. Looking at the young man, Gladstone said sternly and steadily, Young man, you are a fool. Go home and think life through. I choose this story to open our study to illustrate what, be, what, bring, what is before us, what is probably the most important question, and that is, what is life? Or to put it in another way, or make it personal, what are you living for? In the vernacular, siguro sa ating mga Pilipino, a popular commercial would say, Para saan ka ba bumabangon? For many, life is just a means of existence. Meaning, just like the animals, the plants, 
they live today or nabubuhay ngayon, pero pagkatapos nun, nawawala na. And that's why for an Epicurean, life can be best summed up by the phrase, let us eat, drink, and be merry. For them, life is that round of one pleasure after another. To the Stoics, life, on the other hand, is something that has to be endured. Nakailangang tiisin. He realized that this world is often filled with tears, with harshness, with wretchedness, suffering, and torment. And therefore, he thinks and decides that living means putting up with all of these things. Going with it, going through it, and carrying it on whatever may come. Is it okay? The, is the audio alright? Or is there thunder outside? <laughs> okay. Meron po akong background dito. Thunder. Anyway. So, and that leads to another view of life, which is the cynical view, where all ideals and hope are almost non-existent. But to us, brethren, who probably are less philosophical, life can just be an opportunity of doing good, of improving the world, and afflicting the state of society, just like a humanist would think. Life can also be our families, our homes, our work, our occupations, our activities in life. It can even refer to the companionship and love of our loved ones. But no matter what view of life we adhere to, it will eventually lead to sorrow, disappointment, and despair. For the simple reason that life's pleasure, just like for a Epicurean, and our endurance for suffering will come to an end. Our opportunity to work, play, and even uplift the world will cease. And all relationship that we hold dear can be taken away at any moment. Interestingly, the Apostle Paul wrote a very important letter with the running theme of joy which we call the epistle of the church to Philippi, or the book of Philippians. In this book, we notice the repetition of the word joy for 16 times. Yet we are aware that Paul's situation is far from being joyful. He was a prisoner in Rome, chained to a soldier 24-7, and to make it worse, there were people envious of him who are causing him much distress because they were preaching Christ out of selfish ambition. Philippians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17 recounts, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than pure, from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Despite that, this section, Philippians 15 to 17, was concluded with, by Paul with what would be our main text this morning. And let me just say that Danny and I did not talk about this. In Philippians 1, verse 18 to 21, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Brethren, just like this section, and throughout the epistle, we will never read 
a tone of despair, neither a plea for sympathy nor a complaint about the situation Paul had. What we will read are repeated expressions of joy. And the reason is because he had a correct view of life, which our text reveals, and this biblical outlook consists of four things. First, we notice that Paul rejoices because he, view, he views life to proclaim Christ. So, if Christ is made known, he is joyful. You see, verse 18, which reads, What then, in every way, whether in pretense and truth, Christ is proclaimed, in this I rejoice, yes, I will rejoice. This could be a statement of a person after being released from prison. Marahil di natin maintindihan yun. Pero sa isang tao na uh, nabilanggo, after being released, we would, he would probably say, I rejoice. Yes, I rejoice. But as we noted, Paul did not receive any notice of release, nor even a favorable verdict giving him a few weeks or months to be detained. The fact is, Paul was staring death squarely with his own eyes. Note the words in the latter part of verse 20, whether by life or by death. Yet, despite that situation, he rejoices and continue to rejoice because Christ is proclaimed. Stephen J. Lawson writes, the priority for Paul is always the magnification of his master. He is not preoccupied with escaping his suffering, nor with rebutting his foes. Paul has a much higher agenda. He is concerned about the name of Christ going forward. For Paul, it matters little what happens to him or what is said about him. As long as the Lord Jesus is glorified, the advancement of the gospel is everything to the apostle. In spite of this fiery trial, Paul can rejoice because Christ is being preached. Brethren, I must be honest. It is a challenge to maintain that perspective. Yet, as God has placed us in different circumstances today, with different trials to bear, we will be prevented from collapsing in our own affliction when we recognize that Christ and life is about making Christ known to others. Just like in this so-called pandemic that we are all in. Many of us would have been in despair, would have been discouraged being in quarantine for several weeks or several months. Had we not seen the Lord using this situation for the furtherance of the gospel, we would have indeed shown much despair. No, siguro, we, have been, we, we could have been very impatient in many other things. Or maybe we could be facing a personal situation where our life is threatened or even with our loved ones being fatally sick. But as we see the gospel moving forward, we are encouraged. Brothers and sisters, we must recognize that as Christians, our life is not about being comfortable, but about Christ being made known. Peter writes to the persecuted Christians scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. A.W. Tozer wrote, In this day of universal apprehension, when men's hearts are failing, then for fear of those things that are coming upon the earth, we Christians are strategically placed to display a happiness that is not of this world and to exhibit 
a tranquility that will be a little bit of heaven here below. When you think about it and you meditate upon those words, those were written many years ago. Yet it sounds very relevant in our COVID-19 era, don't you think? But the second thing we notice is that Paul views life recognizing the sovereignty of God. In the beginning phrase of verse 19, Paul writes, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. The word know is an expression of absolute confidence and knowledge. It is not hoping that it will turn out good. And marami sa atin would think that way. I know this will turn out good, but we're not sure. But Paul had a settled conviction. He, he was certain that this will turn out for his deliverance. It is interesting to note that the word deliverance in the Greek is the word soteria, from where we get the word soteriology. And that is the study of the doctrine of salvation. And though this word soteria may refer to the material and temporal deliverance from danger and apprehension, and therefore can be interpreted that this situation will turn out good for his health, will turn out good for his well-being, his welfare, and even that he will be vindicated in court. But for Paul, it meant that he will surely be saved from the sentence of death and will be released from prison. Yun po yung kanyang pananaw. For some of us who knows Paul's history, we know that Paul was released in AD 62 to 63. And he was able to preach for another six years, for he died probably in AD 64 or 68. But when Paul wrote this letter, he did not know about that. And therefore, what he is saying in Philippians 1 verse 20, But that with all boldness, Christ even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, he was confident not of a deliverance from his present predicament, as if meron po siyang padrino or he has an insider, a lawyer, or a sponsor handling his case in the courts of Rome so that it will be dismissed. That was not his mindset. That was not his view. What he was confident of is the sovereignty of God. And because of that, he knows that he will soon be released from the imprisonment one way or another. He will be delivered or saved either by death, and that means he will be with Christ, or even by dismissal. It is interesting that this very words of Paul, that this will turn out for my deliverance, was actually a verbatim quote of the Greek translation of Job 13 verse 16, where Job says, this also will be my salvation. For Paul, being a Pharisee and a scholar in Scripture, has actually identified his own problems and his own struggles with that of Job. He knew that Job was a righteous man and that God put him in a situation of suffering. And just like Job, he knew God will deliver his righteous man, righteous ones, no matter what he went through, even to the point of death. That was his assurance. As Job 19, verse 25 to 26 says, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, He will take His stand on the earth, even after my skin is destroyed. Yet from my flesh, I shall see God. So as Paul was in prison in Rome, awaiting trial, he is giving expression to the very conviction of what he wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, 
to those who are called according to His purpose. Therefore, whether He was released from prison in this life, whether He was vindicated at His trial, or whether it worked out for His physical well-being, or whether He went to glory as a martyr, He would be in every way delivered. See the perception or the perspective of Paul in this particular verse. He is safe in the loving arms of the Father. Quoting Pastor Stephen Lawson again, Paul knows that he will soon be released from this imprisonment one way or another, either by death or by dismissal. Paul believes that his life is held in the hands of the sovereign God. It is this conviction in the overruling authority of God that gives him great joy. He would be filled with fear if he did not trust in this formidable truth. He would have no joy if he thought that his circumstances were governed by random chance. Paul lays his head on the pillow of the sovereignty of God each night. And he sleeps well on it. I like that expression. He lays his head on the pillow of the sovereignty of God. And he sleeps on it. I hope that throughout this time of the pandemic, you are not having some sleepless nights. Because we can trust in the sovereignty of God. You see, this reminds me of what Psalm 127 verse 1 to 2 says. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for He gives to His beloved even in his sleep. Brethren, God is sovereign. Isaiah 40 verse 15 says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and as regarded a speck of dust on the scales. Psalm 115 verse 3, But God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. And that's why Paul has regarded himself not as a prisoner of Rome, but as a prisoner of Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 1, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ. Philemon 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And in 2 Timothy 1 verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, His prisoner. Therefore Rome, Caesar, the government, and even the fearless and strong army of the empire are just instrument in the hand of God to accomplish His war, His will and plan in the Apostle Paul and even for the rest of the world. In fact, Paul testified about it when he said in the previous section in Philippians 1 verse 12 to 14 that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because, okay, because of my imprisonment have a far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. And if so, and if God so wills for him to be released, that is deliverance. And if God allows him to be put to death, that still is salvation to Paul. They are all just pawns that will usher him to where his beloved Savior and Lord, which is ultimate salvation, glory, and bliss for the apostle. Third, Paul rejoices because he lives with expectation and hope. Our passage reads, Philippians 1 verse 18 to 20, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. 
according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything but that with all boldness Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. Kent West translate this phrase according to my earnest expectation and hope as undivided and intense expectancy. Apokarak Dokia, that's the Greek word. And it meant to watch with one's head erect and or outstretched so as to direct attention with intense expectation and earnest watching. Siguro po, pag minsan meron tayong gustong makita, di ba? We're trying to stretch our necks so that we would be able to have a better view of what we want to see. And the picture is that of Paul's consecrate, concentrated intense hope which ignores others' interests and strains forward. He is telling us that his head is erect and outstretched and his attention is turned away from his current adversities and he is riveted upon just one objective and that is the exaltation of Christ. Brethren, Paul was confident in the promise of heaven, including the reception of his glorified body. As Christ promised in John 14, do not let your heart be troubled, verse 1 to 4. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And, and you know the way where I am going. And as John encouraged all believers in 1 John 3 verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him. Because we will see Him just as He is. Evidently, Paul was not concerned about the verdict of his earthly trial. His concern was that for his earthly testimony for Christ, so that Christ will be exalted. And that was his primary objective. That's why his head is straightened and his neck is outstretched. He was well aware that as a follower of Christ, he had been bought with a price and therefore he should glorify God. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And he also wrote in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15 And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Brethren, look at the last phrase. That they who live, and that is you and I, no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. So Paul wanted his witness to heighten the effect of God's power and plan. He is aware that he will also stand trial before Caesar and be examined about his faith in Christ. And by God's grace and help, he hoped that he would be made strong and confident in that hour and be a faithful witness who will not be ashamed. You see, saying those words may seem to be odd to our ears. Why? Because isn't Paul was the one who wrote Romans 1.16 where he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel? But you see, looking at the other passages, we will see that Paul himself requests or gave a petition like this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. He said, Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. And we did not only see this or read this kind of petition once, we also read in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, where it says, Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us 
a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. Note that Ephesians and Colossians are prison epistles. And therefore, he was asking this. He was making this request to the believers, to Christians, to the churches, while he was in prison. Katulad po nung probably ginawa natin kanina in fellowship. Ano ba yung prayer request mo? And Paul's prayer request is that he might be given utterance, in, in, uh, that he might be given boldness to declare the mystery of the gospel. Surely, Paul was a, a courageous man. Yet, he also knows his weakness or weaknesses. Moreover, if you would care to note, in this passage, we, we did not see or read, I will exalt Christ. Instead, what, he, what Paul said is that, that Christ will be exalted. What this means is that Paul did not rely on his own boldness, on his own courage, but rather on the help of the Holy Spirit to produce the exaltation of Christ through him. Paul is saying then that as they prayed for him and as God's Spirit enabled him, he would be delivered from denying Christ and disgracing the gospel at his trial before Caesar. And that he would be vindicated not in the court of Caesar, but in the ultimate court before God by exalting Christ even through martyrdom if need be. The only cause for shame to Paul will not to hear well done from Christ when he stood before him. What about us? Are we concerned? Are we passionate that God might be exalted in our life? That we do care about the testimony that we give with our words or with our actions. That is why for the Apostle Paul, his focus was not on getting released from prison, but rather on exalting Christ. Whether he lived or died was not the issue. All that mattered to Paul, all that his head and neck was training forward to, was that he would be able to exalt Christ, whether by life or by death. Fourth, as a capstone to his whole explanation, Paul can rejoice because he views life as living for Christ. Reading once again our text this morning, Philippians 1, 18 verse and to 21, Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. At this point, Paul is essentially saying, in relation to the previous section, in verses 12 to 17, he is saying, regardless of what his friends and enemies are doing, I will live for Christ. But in saying that, he is also concluding this section intimating to us that the reason why he rejoices, the reason why he rejoiced as long as Christ's name is proclaimed. The reason why he can be confident that things will turn out for his deliverance. And the reason why he lives in expectation and desire that God may be exalted is because he lived for Christ. A.T. Robertson say, explains that Paul is giving us his own view of living. And living for Christ is his greatest good, the summon bonum of his life. It is his life's truest meaning, 
the greatest satisfaction and most complete fulfillment is in Christ and in His life live out through Him. It is worthy of note that the literal rendering of this verse in the Greek has no verb. So wala po yung salitang is. Which makes the statement more dramatic and pointed. For me to live Christ. And that could be paraphrased this way. To go on living Christ. Thus making it relevant for the Apostle Paul that as he was awaiting his sentence as a prisoner, so if he live after this imprisonment, he live for Christ. And if he die, that's gain because he live for Christ. But what does it really mean to live Christ? You see, this phrase, uh, one of the most common expressions of Paul in all his letter is the expression, in Christ. And using a concordance, you will find that that expression in Christ would have 90 times of occurrence in the New Testament. The most prominent probably is 2 Corinthians 5.17 where we read, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. And for our context, Paul actually begins his letter by saying, Philippians 1 verse 1, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. So, says, Paul says to live Christ. But one of the prominent and most expression is the word in Christ. And we could probably see that it refers or there is a relationship between the two. The concept of being Christ was vital to Paul's understanding of what it means to be a Christian. And the moment a person truly believes in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, he is joined orga organically in a living, real union with Christ. So that's the idea. Because we are in Christ. Jesus is the head. We are the members of His body. The church. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we were baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, You are Christ's body and individual members of it. So to be in Christ means that all that is true of Christ is true of a believer. Because nakikristo na nga po tayo. As Paul writes in Romans 6, 6, verse 10 and 11, For the death he died... He died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. The explanation, even so, consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The believer then is in union with Christ. As a familiar passage in Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 6 further explains, but God being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgression, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that is our true standing in Christ. We were made alive, we were raised up, and seated with Him. But as that is our standing before God, we must also grow in our experience of the reality of that standing. So, in our daily lives, we live in fellowship with Christ, communing with Him and depending on Him for everything. As Jesus instructed His disciples in John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So to be in Christ is to be not only in that standing of being raised up, being made alive and seated with him, but it also means that we grow in our experience in fellowship with Christ. But it also means that we grow to know Christ intimately. 
Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. This verse and this confession of Paul was made not at the beginning of his Christianity or, or his conversion. That I may know him. He made this confe confession after 30 years of being a Christian. He was converted AD 33 to 36, and he wrote Philippians AD 60 to 62. And therefore, as a believer, and for, probably for many of us who have been in the faith for many years, sometimes we have lost the drive to know Christ. But Paul, after 30 years of being a believer, a follower of Christ, serving Him, still says that I may know Him. He constantly desired to know Christ intimately and experience the resurrection power of Christ's life. And so that is what it meant for him to be in Christ. It is not just to have that standing of being made alive, raised up, and seated in the heavenly place with Christ, but to live that out, knowing him more in his life. And it also means growing to love Christ with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark 12, verse 30, And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Furthermore, to be in Christ means submitting all my thoughts, emotions, words, and deeds to the Lordship of Christ, so that I may seek to please Him in all respects. Colossians 1.10 says, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Brethren, to be in Christ meant not just to be in right standing before God, but to also grow to experience Christ as our Lord or our all in all. Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, He put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Every respect of life must be centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the glorious person of Christ, and nothing less, is the Christian life. John MacArthur puts it this way, I am totally wrapped up in Christ. Loving Him, knowing Him, preaching Him, serving Him. Christ is the raison d'etre, the reason for my being, the reason for my existence. He doesn't mean Christ is the source of life, though He is. He doesn't mean Christ lives in Him, though He does. He doesn't mean Christ controls Him, though He does. He doesn't mean Christ wants to submit to Him, though He does. He simply means living is Christ. Life is summed up as Christ. I am filled with Christ. I am occupied with Christ. I trust Christ, love Christ, hope in Christ, obey Christ, preach Christ, follow Christ, fellowship with Christ. Christ is the center, circumference of my life. It is all Christ and Christ alone. Christ alone is my inspiration, my direction, my meaning, my purpose, consumed, dominated by Christ. That is what is meant to, for us to be in Christ, and that is what is meant to live Christ. Of course, our experience of living Christ is a process that would never be fully realized in this life. In this life, we would never reach a point where we are not tempted by sin, where we do not have to battle the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, as 1 John 2.16 reminds us. But brethren, each one of us 
who truly are children of God or who profess to be a Christian should have our focus to live in an ex experiential way the fact of our union with Christ so that He becomes our all in all. As Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 12, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul clearly was determined to live Christ as his sole aim. He expresses it er elsewhere, no? not only in Philippians, but in other passages with, the, with slightly differing terms, but with the same idea. 1 Corinthians 9.23, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Philippians 3 verse 7, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Philippians 3, 13 to 14, one thing I do, I press on toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Christ was Paul's constant aim. And brethren, let me just say this. If in our conversion we are made to be in Christ, then this is what it means to be a Christian, to live Christ. It involves living primarily and preeminently for Christ. Everything else in life is secondary. And Paul was not writing to the church of Philippi to say that you will, that you will, that you will be super Christians. That, you, that super Christians are the ones who live for Christ. No, he was writing to a church of believers just like this church. And he is saying, for me to live Christ. And that is what a Christian should be. As Paul, as Paul clearly said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I believe for many of us, this is our life verse, right? That's mine. And it says, I now live in the flesh. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. To live Christ is to live your entire life as found in Christ. And that's what a true Christian is. As professing believers, we need to honestly evaluate our lives considering this statement for me to live Christ. It is easy to fall into living for good things, but not for the best. God has graciously blessed us with our families, with our friends, with our homes, possessions, work, leisure, and many other enjoyments. But if we are not careful, these good things become the things we are living for. We need to keep asking ourselves, what if this person, if this thing, or if this activity is taken from me? Certainly, it would be difficult just like Job if we will lose our children, our health, and our possession. But if we truly live for Christ, we will be able to come through any tragedy without despair because Christ cannot be taken from us because we are in Christ. And so we must constantly evaluate our life asking, is Christ at the center? Is He my all in all? Brethren, let me ask you, how would you complete this sentence? For me, to live is blank. What word or phrase would you put in that blank? Probably if your name is Michael Jordan or LeBron James, you would have probably put there, for me, to live is basketball. If your name is Bill Gates, probably you would put there, 
for me to live is Microsoft. If you're a parent, you might put the word, my children. If you are married, you might say, my spouse. If you're a career person, you might say, becoming the next CEO or COO. If you're a lawyer, maybe winning the big case. If you're in school, you might say, or put there, finishing school with honors or even topping the boards. The list of possibilities are endless. It could be anything fun or entertaining. It can be money or fame or success or just winning the big game. But brethren, don't miss the point. No one leaves that sentence blank. Meron at meron po kayong ilalagay doon. Everyone finishes that sentence with something. And if you do not fill that blank with Christ, what word will you put in there? As the Apostle Paul concludes, he not only said, for me to live is Christ, but he also said, to die is gain. It has often been stated that a person is not ready to live unless he is ready to die. And the only reason Paul could say death is gain is because he lived Christ. Paul has counted everything else as lost for the sake of Christ. As Philippians 3 verse 7 reminds us, whatever things were gained to me, I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. And Paul has invested his entire life in the goal of knowing and serving Christ. Also, and therefore, death would usher Paul into the Lord's presence where he would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your master as Matthew 25, 21 and 23 tells us. And in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 8, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. As a familiar saying would go, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. And so, it is gain because death opens the door for him to receive the promised rich returns of all that he has invested for Christ. But more than receiving the reward, death is gain because a true believer goes immediately to be with Christ. In the succeeding verse of Philippians 1, verse 21, in verse 22 to 23, Paul says, But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. For I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Paul is saying that when he departs, or when he dies, he will be with Christ, and that is very much better. In 1 Corinthians 5 verse 8, Paul teaches that to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, what is, the most, what is most important in heaven is not the streets of gold nor the, per, the gates of pearl. The greatest gain of being in heaven is not even to be reunited with loved ones, though that will truly happen and some of us are looking forward to that. But the greatest profit, the greatest gain will be to stand before Christ and behold Him as He is. The glory of heaven is found in Jesus Christ himself. He lived for Christ and therefore to die is gain. In his sermon, the Puritan preacher Alexander McLaren explains why death is gain. He said, first, we lose everything we don't need. We lose the world, the flesh, and the devil. We lose our trials, our troubles, our tears, our fears, and our weaknesses. But second, we keep everything that matters. We keep our personality, our identity, and our knowledge of all that is good. 
And then third, according to Alexander McLaren, we gain what we never had before. We gain heaven, the saints, the angels, the presence of God, and Jesus, more importantly, Himself. As we end, let us ask ourselves, what are you living for? How do you view life? Post pre-COVID-19 and COVID-19 era, or even pre-Ulysses and after Ulysses typhoon? Can you say together with Paul, for me to live Christ, to die, gain. If you do, then you have the right view of life and your joy will never be taken away from you for we can never be taken away from Christ. Before we pray, can I request everyone to please stand up and let us just sing the song that we sang earlier in worship. And then afterwards, we'll be praying. the sin of the cross and not be changed by the love in your face how can I look at the nails in your hands and not be moved by the price that you pay how can my the road that you walked then turn my back and just go on my way I see you now oh my Lord and my God and I am faced with the choice that I must make I choose to live for you alone To make your cross my only glory And your grace my only hope To yield my will And to make my heart your own I choose to live this life you give Oh, I 
God, we thank you for this morning that we could feast at your word and sit at your feet. Indeed, Lord, many things in our life have confronted us with this truth. We always face two ways to live for Christ or to live for ourselves but if you have saved us if we are your children the choice has been made for us and we pray that we might be faithful in living out the true reality of living Christ, of being in Christ. And we pray that as we do, may your name be magnified. May your name be proclaimed at all times. Oh God, we thank you for this privilege that you have given us to look at your word. And we pray, Father God, that you will presence your Holy Spirit would continue to minister and speak to us through your word. Bless our time, Lord God, and even as we leave later on, be with each one. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. We have a few announcements. Okay, first of all, we'd like to announce the... What is first here? Okay, shepherding your children during a crisis. That's November 28th. That's uh, at 1.30 p.m. Dito po sa center. And some people have been asking, uh, uh, pwede daw po bang uh, Zoom? Yes, but we do encourage you, however, if you can be here uh, for that uh, particular activity that will be much better po. Uh, we, it is a forum so we encourage you to, to share, to ask questions and we would like uh, that dynamic into this uh, particular ministry so uh, while you can participate via Zoom for, but I would suggest that if you can make it do come uh, para po lamang yun uh, sa mga hindi po talaga makadadalo for uh, some very important or critical reason. Okay, so uh, that's November 28, 1.30 p.m. right here in the center. Next. Okay, Help for Katanduan is underway as you might have noticed uh, in some parts here in the uh, center. There are boxes still ready and they will be collected, I think, later this afternoon after the afternoon service. So if you are still donating, uh, you may do that up to next Sunday, kasi tatlong Sundays po natin uh, gagawin ito. And uh, please, uh, people have been asking about uh, rice. Can they do that? Uh, I had uh, 
text blast through the cell servants that you, you may donate rice, pero preferably by today po sana before uh, they're carted away uh, because there is a, there will be a, a huge truck that will come to haul off all of the items and then uh, bahala na po si Brother Ariel with his contacts in the Philippine Air Force to uh, bring them over to Catanduanes. So, hanggang next Sunday po, ang third Sunday na natin, uh, hanggang next Sunday po ang donations for Catanduanes. Um, so, we pray that uh, you will uh, take note of that. Uh, so, rice, and then some people have been asking about uh, cash donations. Uh, sabi namin, sige, we'll find a way to bring them or send them to the church there. Um, and But if you do, if you would like to donate, uh, you can just indicate that on the envelopes and then drop them in our tight boxes. Okay? So, and then we'll, bahala na po kami, we'll find a way to send them to, the, the money to the church there. Okay? So, that's it. Let's all rise for our final song. Please greet one another, brethren. Let's give praise to the Lord for what He has accomplished in our gathered worship this morning.